Hey everybody, what's up? Trooper here with Trooper as usual. And today we've got a very special guest, lawyer Josh Marcus from MKM Esports. How's it going, Josh? What's up, Josh? Doing great. Doing great, Troopers. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're good. We're always I love good. I, I love the way that he addressed us. No one's thought of that before, so no, I appreciate I'm sure. that. I must be the first. <laughs> yeah, you, you actually are. Easier. You oh. actually are. You just got yeah, creative excellent. bonus points. Um, but today, guys, obviously, you know the biggest discussion going on in the Fortnite community, the biggest in almost all of gaming, actually, and all of these. Oh yeah, is this phase T food debacle? So we thought that it would be uh, an interesting episode for you guys to kind of get an actual lawyer on here, somebody who actually understands this stuff and can kind of break down what is going on, at least to the extent of uh, the knowledge that's publicly available right now. So we can kind of talk about all that and, and really get to the bottom of this for you guys, or well, at least as best we can. Um, so Josh, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, you know, how you got into esports law and uh, what you do currently, you know, who you work with and all that sort of thing to kind of let the fans know who you are and why they should be listening to you here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so myself and my business partner, uh, Evan Cubis, we launched Canada's first law firm uh, and management agency dedicated exclusively to esports and content creators. So we operate here out of out of Toronto. Um, and on the uh, on the legal side, we represent uh, tournament organizers, uh, documentary filmmakers, uh, teams, players, uh, kind of you name it in the esports space. Um, mostly in corporate law, but we do uh, contracts, litigation, IP all, all around. Um, so of course, we're, we're keeping a close eye on, on all this recent news. Uh, on the agency side, we represent about uh, 250 content creators, gamers, uh, venues, ancillary entities, um, and that's all done through, through our new uh, company called Rumble Gaming. Uh, so a lot going on and, uh, you know, it's definitely a fun industry to, to be launching in. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's got to be you know like doing law and oil and gas or something, right? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I started in insurance law, so this is uh, oh, God. this is a step up for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. It sounds like it. But with that many content creators and, and people that you guys work with, you know, I think it's a fairly safe bet for everybody to make that you guys have seen your fair share of contracts. You know your way around. You know what the esports industry standard is, if there even is such a thing. Really, we can kind of get into that. Um, but definitely a great source for us to rely on here to kind of break some of this down for us and really figure out what's going on. Um, so I think we should just get right into it and start with, you know, what happened. So Tifu, uh, if you guys, if you're watching the show, there's a zero, there's like a negative chance that you don't know who this is, but just in case you live, have been living under some rock and somehow found this by happy accident. Um, it's all the insurance the lawyers tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of the biggest content creators uh, in Fortnite. He represents FaZe Clan, which is one of the biggest and longest standing. And honestly, to date, it's been one of the more prestigious esports organizations that there is. You know, I'd have FaZe right up there with, you know, the Optics, the Cloud9s, TSM, CLGs. Um, you know, they're, they're a big fish. Uh, so it's a huge partnership, huge news, obviously. And his al allegations essentially boil down to a couple of things. Uh, the first is that 80% of his money was being taken. Which obviously, you know, that sounds like an egregious amount, and I think uh, we could probably all agree to that—that that you shouldn't have eighty percent of your money taken. You know, we can get into actually what's happening, more specifics in a little bit. But the allegation is that Phase is taking eighty percent of his money, and that they are prohibiting him from doing work with other brands, other people, um, and and just making money for himself in general. And that he's essentially being owned by Phase Clan, and they kind of use him as a puppet. They tell him what to do, and they make all the money, and he just does all the work. Uh, this is what. The essential allegation is um, obviously, you know, in esports, it wouldn't be esports if we didn't get an immediate response from the other side, <laughs> and we get both sides on the table immediately. Which, again, we can talk about how much that, sense that makes. But we have the allegations uh, response here from Phase Clan that we can pull up for you guys. Their official uh, wording here. So what they've said is that we're shocked and disappointed to see the news of his press article and lawsuit Tifus over the course of our partnership with him, uh, which began in April of 2018, so just over a year ago now, FaZe Clan has collected $0 from tournament winnings, Twitch revenue, YouTube revenue, or any social platform. In fact, we've only collected a total of $60,000 from this partnership, while Tifus has earned millions as a member of FaZe. Um, while contracts are different with each player, all of them, including Tifus, have a maximum of 20% to FaZe Clan in both tournament winnings as well as content revenue, with 80% to the player in Turner's case, which is uh, Tifus' real name. Neither of those have been collected by FaZe Clan. We're proud of what we've accomplished together over the past year with Turner and will continue to support him. So, their original response, very positive. 
interesting that they would have a contract that would entitle them to take a bunch of money and then them saying they take nothing. <laughs> I'm kind of yeah. that, yeah. that a little bit that, of uh, some backpedaling that we've been that, seeing. That uh, makes from, me scratch my head. Well, yeah. it also when you respond right away, and and <laughs> if I were Faze's lawyer, um, you know, you you want to put a stop to that right away. Yeah, I'll tell you right now that 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 statement there certainly wasn't drafted by a lawyer. Um, you know, even the wording that they use over the course of this partnership, FaZe has collected zero dollars from Twitch partnerships or from Twitch streaming. No, FaZe has collected. I haven't seen any numbers. I guarantee you they've collected more than one dollar over the course of that partnership. Um, and that could just seem like semantics, but that's the type of early response that will come back to bite them uh, down the line in court. Uh, you know, I, I would say even putting that $60,000 figure on it uh, is, is shocking. Why would you even attempt to monetize or to, to put an amount on that uh, money in dispute? As soon as you're, you know, shown that you're paid out $60,001, your, your credibility goes right out the window. Well, definitely not uh, not the greatest start for FaZe, and unfortunately, they didn't stop there. We actually saw that they responded to that original post themselves and gave a couple of other posts here. So, you know, again, after hearing the community feedback, they want to address uh, FaZe Clan taking 80% of his brand deal earnings. So here they actually did, you know, they released the clause, the direct clause from Tifu's contract, apparently. Um, and it says that brand deals featuring the gamer that exist on gamer or ga on companies' content creation platforms, examples, Twitch, YouTube, or social media sites, if the deal is brought to the gamer by the company, 20% to the gamer and 80% to the company. So this basically says, and Josh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in layman's terms, I think what this says is that if the company is the one who secures the sponsorship, they get 80% of the profit, 80% of the revenue. That's correct? Correct. Okay. And again, another weird statement because they say, let us be clear, we've never collected any of this from Tifu or any other FaZe Clan member, which makes you wonder why is this in a contract in the first place then? Um, is it to make them seem like they're being really nice guys? Because like, hey, look, we know there's this terrible clause in your contract, but we're not going to uphold it. Like what, can you weigh in on this, Josh? Like why would you have a clause like this if you're not using it apparently? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to remember FaZe Clan has a lot of contracts out there and and when we're going through these negotiations, lawyers will generally start with the precedent, especially if it's for that same client or same company. So, you know, phase is not, they, they could rewrite their contract whenever, you know, a lawyer or an agent makes an issue of something, um, but they're taking that contract as is. And then those are generally the numbers that I guess they use for everyone and, and nobody negotiated that down. You know, I think this goes to something which I'll repeat throughout this whole episode if you're a gamer and you're watching and you have a contract in front of you have somebody look over it you know we offer pro bono no charge services to to gamers to read their contracts i know there are a lot of lawyers down in the states um who do too if you contact me i will point you in their direction um but have somebody read over the contracts um because that that's really what the problem is with this no nobody thought of it <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that's kind Very of alarming true. it is alarming and i mean Look, you know, you hear, um, I would say, from lawyers who tend to work more with gamers and, you know, full disclosure, aside from the pro bono services, I work with a lot of teams as well. Um, you know, what you're hearing from them is you're pushing that 80-20 split, which I think everybody can agree is, is too much. Um, but the response that the lawyers get when they try to negotiate this is, well, this is how it's done in the industry, um, which is is true to some degree. You know, I, I haven't seen anything that's an 80 to 20 split um, in favor of a team, but, you know, there are a lot of crappy contracts out there and, you know, I don't blame teams for trying to monetize on their assets. And, and that's what these are, their assets, um, gamers, you know, team members. Um, but but at a certain point, you know, you, you have to treat your your staff right. And that's what they are. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so what what is a more common split? You know, if eighty twenty isn't very uh, personable, let's just say, and <laughs> it sounds like it's not very common either. What like what is the more common split that that you see? If you well, well, I, I should say, you know, this one particular clause that that they've highlighted here, it's it's brand deals um, that yes are brought to them by the team, and and frankly, most of their brand deals are going to be brought to them by the team. Um, but that's only one clause in this. You know, the rest of the contract, as I've seen it, 
is more in line with the industry standard, which is generally 80% to the player, 20% to the team for things like tournament winnings, which again, FaZe has said they haven't collected on. Um, and 50-50 is actually still quite common. You know, I think gamers don't want to hear it, but teams do need to make money and, you know, they are investing in, in their talent. Um, so it's expected that the, the team is going to take a cut. 80-20 um, in favor of the company is too much. It's usually the other way around, but I, I would go over 50-50. Okay. Um, and then I think it's, a, it's an important distinction here that you made that this is for a very specific type of deal, right? Where the brand actually goes out, negotiates, does all the legwork to secure the sponsorship, talks to another brand, uh, where somebody like FaZe Clan goes and we're, we're talk to a Samsung or a Logitech or a Razer, like, hey, listen, here's our team, here's our social media reach, blah, 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 blah. We can have this one player named Tifu. He's super popular. We can work a specific deal with him where he does stuff for you. And then because they've done all that work, they get to keep 80% of that. Um, you know, it's... Yeah. I mean, take take a, a TV commercial, right? A cable commercial. If FaZe Clan wanted to, you know, produce their own commercial, put it out on cable network, um, and, and derive some income from that, it would make sense that only 20% would go to TV, right? He shows up, he gets filmed, right? You get a little bit of money. We're the ones putting in the effort. And I, I don't think it would be that egregious in that scenario. Um, you know, if you're talking about kind of your standard sponsorship where they're tweeting five, 10 times and mentioning um, sponsors on air, then yeah, 80, 20, you know, seems a little high considering the talent's doing all the work. Um, but I think it's really that contextual approach that, um, at least as a lawyer, I'm looking forward to seeing a court comment on, um, and taking that contextual approach and saying, you know what, it's not as cut and dry as we're just going to call everything 80-20 or 50-50, um, because it's a new area. This is part of influencer marketing. This is part of the new generation of people consuming media. It's it's a shift in the approach we have to really look at these contracts and the the issues that we have to be cognizant of as lawyers advising on these contracts. Well, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because every as as we know, everything in esports is moving so fast, faster than a lot of people can even keep up with. So when stuff like this happens, a lot of people also have to take into account like like you say it's time for a lot of people to kind of put their focus on these contracts. You have to hash this th these things out because people, this is kind of in a, a Wild West scenario where people might be getting taken advantage of if they're not reading the fine print because a lot of these players are younger. They're impressionable because they want to be professionals. So if an organization comes along, they're going to think that they're going to help them. And in Tifu's case, I, I'm pretty sure he was with FaZe for a long time. He was a professional player, I believe, on H1Z1 and a couple other uh, Battle Royale games. I believe PUBG. I'm not sure, though, but he he basically he was on phase uh, far before he blew up on Fortnite and had these insane stream numbers but now he's in this uh position where he's like pretty much one of the top streamers on Twitch uh, i would say besides ninja he he's up there with ninja and shroud as like the top content creators and the people that pull in the most subs so now he has this opportunity where all these other sponsors and endorsements are coming his way but now he realizes this is now he's realizing and finally has this this uh this uh, hindsight well, essentially where he should probably have made better choices and he realized maybe that it's not not going to be that easy so he just wants to try and get out as soon as possible probably probably just trying to uh you know recoup on his mistakes a little bit but uh you know it's easy to get complacent for a while and then when you hit this a certain uh, position like him uh i can see why you might notice like hey you know i i, I can definitely be getting a lot more on my own and I, at this point i seem to be, be you guys seem to be benefiting off of me more than i seem to be benefiting off of you yeah i mean it, it's just hard to know when that when that transition happened though right because it does exactly seem like it's i mean very, it happened so it up fast. On his stream he showed his uh that chart of tfue's like viewers and stuff like that and you see the day he signs phase clan it just goes like this it's like this gigantic <laughs> so yep. like at a certain point maybe now it makes more sense for him to be getting the money but originally right. you know like would he even be in this position were it not for phase clan and phase clan I giving him access to all of their their original reach because the hardest thing is a streamer or a content creator is getting over that original bump right it's I'll much easier to get from 1,000 to 10,000 viewers than it is to get from zero to a thousand absolutely as weird as that sounds 100%. A lot of people don't even remember that uh, when Courage, uh, who's one of the top Fortnite streamers right now, he he went from esports casting in Call of Duty right into full-time streaming. 
but he got picked up by Optic Gaming uh, under their brand for, as a content creator. He was on there for probably like a month, and he blew up so quickly that he he essentially surpassed them in in branding to where he wanted to focus more on his own and then he was able to get all these other endorsements once he got out of that contract so he was able to you know realize that soon soon enough when you have somebody like tifu who's a lot younger uh yeah i can see why it might take a little bit of time but uh you know it, now's the time to really put the focus on that and i think you know this is such a big story not just fortnite but esports as a whole like this is something that a lot of players might need to double check on absolutely but you know i would just wonder you know at what point or what protections are there for the the organizations or the teams, right? You have teams who are investing a lot of money and a lot of resources into growing that talent and getting them over that that initial bump, as you said. Um, and a lot of these organizations, quite frankly, are, you know, if you look at the investment market, they are attracting investors at 15 times their revenue, which I have to tell you is, is pretty ludicrous. And the, exactly. And the investment community is scratching their heads trying to figure it out and you know it's fine it's hard to put a value on these organizations because we know that there's going to be growth um but at the same time people expect teams to make money at some point and if they don't make money that is going to hurt the industry um because you're going to need someone to, to hire these players right and to pay them um so you know there has to be a balance and you you, you have to have some rights to players and their content otherwise you know you're not going to sign them why bother yeah, especially when you think about all the stuff like an organization like FaZe Clan does do for its players. I mean, they have these elaborate gaming houses out in Los Angeles or California, you know, these beautiful houses in a beautiful spot where everybody wants to live. Um, they usually have professional chefs or cooks that can kind of cook meals. A lot of the times they'll help you. I know this was like something that Optic was really famous for is that they helped build your brand up, right? They wanted you to become your own brand, but they taught you everything that they knew. They're like, we're going to teach you everything that took us However long between the inception of Optic and you getting here, we're going to teach all that to you as fast as you can, as we can rather. And then maybe you'll learn more stuff on your own and then that's great. But it's almost, to me, it almost is a sign of the immaturity of some of the, the, the people in the industry overall and just how young everybody is that it's like, well, I'm bigger than you now. I don't need you anymore. It's like, yeah, but that's like spitting in your parents' face, you know, as soon as, like, as, soon as they you make a little bit of extra <laughs> yeah. money or something. And it's like, hey, we've kind of fed you and clothed you and did everything for like 18 years. You could be at least a little bit grateful, right? Like, um, No, 100%. So yeah, I completely, uh, I completely see that the teams are in a tough spot here because a lot of teams actually have been, I, I don't know if you can comment on this, Josh, but I've heard that teams are actually running player revenue through top line revenue, which essentially means that they're claiming all individual player revenue as like, their revenue and then is that is that true well yeah i mean <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh god the the way these contracts are generally structured is a player is an independent contractor and you know whether or not they qualify as one is is something that you know is going to be for the courts to decide but for now they're an independent contractor um which means if I'm a team owner, I have all my contractors out there and they're making money and that's going to me and I'm paying out my contractors uh, based on what they earn. So I'm paying them their 80%, their 20%, their 50%, what have you. Um, yes, it's happening. Uh, frankly, I mean, I don't necessarily see that as a problem. I think it's personally... I see why the or it simplifies things on the organization side, right? You avoid issues like income tax, like workers' compensation, right? It's, you know, maybe not the best for gamers, but at the same time, it could be a necessary evil. You know, if we start bringing in um, players as, as employees or as some al alternative, uh, which might be necessary, you know, you just open up a whole other can of worms. So is, is it a question of which one's better? Uh, you know, who knows? And that's, that's honestly becoming more standard, not just in esports, but pretty much everywhere. You see companies yeah. everywhere today trying, especially in the U.S. where, you know, uh, healthcare wasn't as mandated and all these coverages and things weren't as mandated by companies previously. And then, you know, new administrations came in. I believe it was the Obama administration that really started forcing like, hey, you got to, you know, provide this and you got to get health insurance for your employees and you got to provide this and X and Y and Z. And then all of a sudden a company goes, well, wait a second, that like doubles the cost of my employee essentially. Yeah. Um, so if they can't double their productivity, which, you know, most people are already working hard, it's not like you can just do that. Then at a certain point, it makes more sense to keep them as an independent contractor. Um, 
which is just I feel like that's just a sign of the times overall. Like that's just a symptom of 2019. More yeah, so esports. You know right? that that part doesn't uh, concern me so much as you know. As, I would still like to see some protection. You know, I yeah. think everybody is going to talk about the need for a player union after this, um, which has its own set of difficulties. Uh, whether that comes from the courts, whether that comes from you know a government enacting laws, or ideally, you know, it'll come internally and we'll see more of a culture shift. You know, I'm I'm not a huge fan of the franchise model that we see in Overwatch or League of Legends, but to their credit. You know, this adds a little more consistency, a little more predictability. You know how much players are going to be paid. They, you know, are getting the benefits that are set out in the contract. There's a lot of oversight from the developers, probably too much. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I said, it's a little more predictable. Um, so that, that, you know, could be yeah. another way around all of this. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, we've actually got someone in the chat, Adamant Gamer, who's kind of made two different points. So the first he said is that apparently the reason for all of this starting is that HyperX came and offered Tifu a buttload of money, and uh, he was unable to accept it with FaZe Clan due to FaZe Clan's existing sponsors. Because it's one thing, you know, it'd be one thing for FaZe Clan to say, hey, you can't work with anybody unless we approve it and say, okay. It's another thing for FaZe Clan to say, hey, listen, we're signed with Astro, so you can't rep another headset company. Exactly. Because, right? Those are two completely different conversations um, no, and that's they're not point. they're not saying hey you can't go get sponsored by hot pockets or something they're saying you can't get sponsored by somebody that directly competes with one of the guys that's already paying our bills because our bills are how we have this house and how we have all this other stuff right so i mean if that is really the case obviously this is a rumor um who knows if that's true if it is true that's really not going to look good on Tifu because that's just going to show you, hey man, like that's not how life works. Like you, you can't just back yeah. out of a contract because somebody offered you more money afterwards. Like you kind of have to deal with it, unfortunately. Um, but the second thing is that he wanted to know, and this was a question specifically for you, um, Josh. He asked, like, if if they're in, independent contractors, players, how does that a change a contract situation, and b are the contracts stable if players are independent contractors? Um. I'll preface all this by saying nothing here is legal advice, right? We're, we're, we're just <laughs> chatting. Um, yes. And every situation is going to be very different. The short answer to the second part of that, um, and I'm not sure what you mean by stable, but, you know, in terms of job security, which is what I think you're referring to, is it's just that you have a contract for a defined period of time. Um, if after one year, you know, you're not competing as hard or you're not earning enough and, you know, you don't warrant that, uh, that salary or that payment, then yeah, they let you go. On the flip side, if you're someone in Tifu's situation and you're on a one-year contract, that one year pops up, you say, hey, I just got an offer for a buttload of money from HyperX and I can't accept that with you guys. So either you need to change my contract or pay me that buttload of money. Um, so, you know, it is kind of that double-edged sword. Uh, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> Sorry, um... I don't know. No worries, no worries. Uh, he, he wanted to know if they're independent contractors, how does that change a contract situation versus being an employee? Oh, um, yeah, that really just goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, if you're an employee, you get taxes deducted, you have workers' compensation or, you know, employment insurance, unemployment insurance, whatever you call it, social security, um, kind of all those deductions that you see on your paycheck as an employee. As an independent contractor, you know, if I'm the team owner, I say, here's your, here's your $200 even. You deal with it. Um, yeah. That's that's kind of the short answer there. <laughs> yeah. So it's a lot less headaches essentially for the team itself. Um, yeah, exactly. And and frankly, you know, it's probably more appropriate. I don't know if um, many team members could be considered employees. Um, that's just an opinion. But uh, anyway, we don't have to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair enough. Um, and I think FaZe Clan actually kind of alluded to some of this, uh, to Adam and Gamer's first point. Like, I think they actually alluded to some of this in one of their tweets. Do we have the second uh, graphic that they had there? Um, right. So, in every corner of sports and entertainment, deals are made based on the perceived value of the talent and the opportunity at the time of the signing. Uh, if talent starts to show, or when, excuse me, talent starts to show a dramatic improvement in value, it's a common practice to renegotiate based on that new value. This happens in sports, music, film, TV, and certainly now in esports and gaming. FaZe has made every effort to respond to Tifu's massive, massive success fairly and accordingly. So they say that in the last several months, we have encouraged and supported any FaZe member interested in hiring a third-party manager and or agent. Uh, 
They know that it's that the industry would benefit from increased professionalism in every aspect of representation, and that you know the last is just a a, a little like we thank our fans and stuff. Now I can't remember where I saw this, but I believe they've said maybe it was in the actual uh, suit itself. No, it couldn't have been, because that would be from Tifu's side. Um, shit, where did they say this? That they said that they have reached out. Maybe it was in uh, Dear Tifu, that YouTube video that Banks came out with. But he said that they had reached out to Tifu's people not once but twice, and been rejected in terms of you know they've gotten no answer and and trying to renegotiate the contract or settle disputes um does that sound like is that plausible this this is where i have and i'm glad you pointed that out um i i also saw that i think it was in the banks video um this is where i have sympathy for tifu because i don't want to start to you know guess on his reasons for doing all this um but i suspect and this all smells of you know a team of lawyers and agents and it's nothing against them who see an opportunity for a test case and that is something that really needs to happen in this industry you have a player who is high profile with an opportunity that warrants this type of renegotiation um that was likely going nowhere and you know litigation was used as a threat and ultimately they moved on it um, I would say people threaten litigation all the time. Um, you know, if you're a lawyer in just about any other industry or certainly the insurance industry, you know, it's not uncommon by any means to be served with a lawsuit. Um, what we have here, and, and I should add that this isn't the first esports related lawsuit by any means. There have been other cases where players are taking team owners to court and saying, hey, you haven't paid us or sponsors, you know, we've done them. Uh, but the point is, you needed somebody who was big enough to warrant the type of attention that they got. Right. So I suspect that there was somebody at some point whispering in their ear and saying, you know what, this is your opportunity um, to really you know, capitalize on the fact that these negotiations, negotiations, pardon me, are not going well. Um, maybe we can win over the press and public opinion and, and see what happens. Um, you know, I'd love to see Tifu's kind of emotional response back to banks. I don't, think we will by any means mostly because his lawyers are, are smarter um, <laughs> but you know that's that's kind of what i'm smelling all this um and just to add one little line that caught my eye in uh in the complaint and this has been repeated in a lot of the, the articles after um is that the complaint uh, claims that tenny suffered quote permanent disfigurement to his arm uh during the skateboarding stunt and even that type of language, right? That that's that's legal language. That is personal injury language. Permanent disfigurement is a legally defined term. Um, but the use of that language, when you put that out into the world and release your, you know, to the news and say, you know, look, he suffered a permanent disfigurement to his arm. I'm picturing his arm, you know, bent backwards, bone sticking out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A cut is a permanent disfigurement. So I don't, really? you know, and absolutely. I mean. Maybe not legally, but a scar. Any yeah, kind of scar, scar, exactly. Right? A scar, okay. right? Uh, not a paper cut. I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> the point being, you know, a permanent disfigurement, just because it's a legally defined term, that might evoke some emotional response. Uh, you see the PR team, the legal team, or whoever it is that's leaking this, uh, really highlighting things like that. So this could have just been literally him falling off his skateboard. Which, you know, if he skateboarded for a FaZe Clan video, I'm willing to bet some money that he skateboards in general, or at least did, uh, prior to all this. Meaning that, you know, I'm sure he's fallen and gotten, like, I know a lot of skateboarders. All of them are messed up in one way or another in terms of what they've done to their bodies. They've either gotten a bad cut, they've broken a bone, if not multiple bones. Sometimes they've needed surgery. Like, skateboarding looks cool, kids, but, you know. Make sure you got the skills. <laughs> and you've seen the videos that Banks posted in his reply, right? I mean, clearly he's not the type of guy who's afraid to jump off a bridge and do a flip and you know go skateboarding and, and make videos. And that's fine. You're entertaining. Um, yeah. You know, you should be doing that. But but that comes a risk, and you're not going to necessarily win by suing your your I almost said employer, your agent, your team. I don't know. Yeah. Suing. <laughs> now. How legally would they even prove? Like, would they have to have actual evidence that FaZe Clan said, hey, we want you to do this specifically on a skateboard and go out and then you fell doing it? Um, 
Because to me, it's, you know, a lot of content creators, especially the ones that I'm friends with and know, even if they have relationships like this, you know, the organization kind of relies on them to be the creative drivers. Like that's what they're there for. They're the ones who come up with the ideas. They know their own brand and themselves best. They're like, I think this would be really fun to do, or this is how I want to do this. And the organization just says, yeah, go for it. Or here, what do you need? A camera? Like you need a guy following you with a camera? What, what do we got to do here? Um, and yeah, at least I mean, in my experience, that's a relationship. So how would they prove this? Well, I mean, if we're, if we're if we're talking just the skateboarding or, or permanent disfigurement, you know, you you get into the whole realm of personal injury, um, and you know, was there a, a duty of care that the team owed to Tifu, um, and was there a breach of that? Were they negligent in allowing him to injure himself? And then from that, did he injure himself? Was it was it a result of them allowing him to do that? And then how much, you know, in damages is that worth? This was almost added as an aside in the in the the lawsuit, right? If this goes to trial, nobody's going to go down that whole personal injury route with medical experts and proving that an injury came from this and this is the value of that. That's not what all this is about. Um, you know, the easiest way really for Tifu to win is on this argument, um, and we we haven't touched on this. And I'll say right now, you know, I operate out of Ontario, so I I can't really comment on California law, but the real allegation that they had was that phase violated California's labor laws and, and particularly the Talent Agency Act. And, you know, without going too far into it, the, the allegations, if proven true, could, by reason of the fact that they couldn't enter into this contract in the first place, just void the whole contract. In which case, Tifu could then go on to HyperX and get his buttload of money. Hmm. So that, that's kind of the easiest way out of all of this for, for Tifu, Okay. is to prove that. <laughs> so what that sounds like to me, though, is that that would, I mean, especially with, you know, a lot of esports teams, I'm assuming that most of those teams use very similar contracts and language, right? Yes. Um, that would kind of completely redefine a lot of, a lot of the current, uh, a lot of the esports contracts and how they're done. And it would almost give any player who is currently signed to a contract a way out if they wanted it because they said hey they could just say hey look this my contract's so similar to this tifu guys if if his was proven to be void then mine is too yeah i mean it will change the way organizations draft their contracts 100 percent. you know one way or another i think this will um show that there's a spotlight on it you know it's now grown to not just the esports world but outside of it right it's trending on twitter um it's it's you know, I've seen CNN I've seen there there are other news sites picking this up so that alone will result in a culture shift or I I hope it does um, you know in terms of that specific law and allegation we would have to hear what the courts have to say because you know there there are a lot of definitions in the statute that are questionable whether they apply and that's not to say that you know they were wrong to bring it it's that we genuinely don't know because they haven't been tested by the courts yet. Um, so if the courts see that as being a problem, then yeah, you're going to have a shift because many teams bring deals to their own players. You know, that's, that's not uncommon by any means. Um, so it is, you know, that, that will be interesting to see how it goes. But again, that's limited to California. Um, and you know, that can only take you so far in, in a, an industry that's very worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have anything to add here, Trooper? I feel like you've just kind of been listening in for the last little bit. I'm trying to learn as much as I can, honestly. I, I, <laughs> that, that, that's the whole thing. We, we, uh, we have the unique ability right now to have a, an actual uh, – somebody who studies in litigation on here to kind of tr – try his best to at least make sense of all this because <laughs> I, know, I know everybody – a lot of people in the community are going to be pretty confused for the most part since also there's – we don't have all the information either. So that, that makes it even harder. There's just a lot of speculation at this point. And that's yeah. what it is. You know, the litigation process is all about uh, discovery is what we call it up here. Um, and that's that, you know, both sides are, are showing their whole case and it's going to be a matter of public record. Um, and I can bet my salary that this will not go to trial and it will settle beforehand um, because people don't want that information out there. Um, and whether that's Tifu realizing that, hey, you know, this might not have been such a great idea, or FaZe realizing, you know what, they might have a point with this whole uh, talent agency bit, it's easier to just pay it off and, and make it all go away and sign your NDAs and, you know, we're going to move on to the next gossip that happens next week. Um, <laughs> 
But one thing that I will add, with, with Faze Klein's response, um, I was just kind of going through his, his statement here. And it's interesting, if you, if you look at his reasoning, none, and his being banks, um, none of these reasons actually refute what, what uh, you know, would be a defense to these allegations. So he's saying they've never collected on the contract clause stating that 80% of earnings from a brand deal brought by the organization. So he's saying, you know, again, it might say 80%, but we've never taken that money. Irrelevant to the talent agency conversation, irrelevant to the is 80% unconscionable question, irrelevant to the other allegations, personal injury and, and drinking and all that. Um, defense number two, Tenney's deal was crafted by a previous legal team, also irrelevant. We hired previous lawyers, we didn't like them, now we have new lawyers. Great, right? Ultimately, doesn't matter. Um, defense three, organizations, new contracts since last summer, um, cap phase plans take at 20%. Sorry, that was, that was poorly worded because I was reading it exactly, but instead of 80%, they're saying they now take 20%. Great going forward, but if Tifu is still signed to this contract, doesn't help them. The last point, as we you know kind of already talked about, is that they've been working to offer an improved deal since September. Um, and that's really the only part of that that you know, speaks to me as providing any defense to this, but, you know, even still, it's just because they've been negotiating doesn't mean that, uh, you know, they were in the right. So it almost sounds like he just basically made an appeal to public opinion rather than an actual defense. Yeah, and, and frankly, I'd say it, it might have worked. I mean, there's a lot of people coming to Tifu's defense, but at the same time, you know, you've got a lot of top people saying like, buddy, you know, what are you doing? You're you're making money, you're a rising star, you know, you're, you know, don't poke the bear, so to speak. Um, even if it needs to be poked, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of gamers who are in very bad contracts, and I've seen them, and, you know, something does need to change. Um, but was this the right moment for it? You know, I was hopeful it was when, it, when I first heard about it, but uh, now I'm not sure. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I agree. It's, it's interesting because, you know, obviously when you've got a brand that big, you've got to be careful because other brands, you know, big, like uh, a brand as big as Tifu, you've got to be careful because other brands might go, well, wait, is this guy going to try and, you know, litigate us over something in our contract? Unless we like, you know, maybe if it's a gigantic brand like Samsung or HyperX, they've got such, they've got like a building full of lawyers, right? They can be confident that their contract is ironclad, but for smaller esports organizations, like, you know, good luck. Working yeah. with Optic, good luck working with Cloud9. Like you better hope your brand can keep its popularity soaring because, you know, the esports industry is a very small room. Like you can yeah. fit most of the people who actually matter into one stadium, no problem. Um, so to kind of burn somebody in that building is generally not the best move. Which I mean, like you said, that has its disadvantages for players because it has kind of stopped people from stepping out of line and and maybe raising some of these concerns when they're necessary. Um, but you know, it's it's a risky move by somebody like Definitely. him. Definitely. Um, we had another question here from uh, Kuba. How will this, if at all, impact FaZe Clan's capital market valuation? <laughs> um, well, I, <laughs> this kind of goes back to, you know, what I was saying earlier. You know, the, the investment community has been very bullish on esports, meaning they see that there's going to be a lot of growth. Um, but again, these teams are valued very, very high. Um, and it's not just phase. It's, you know, anybody who's going through capital raises, which is just about every team right now, if they're not already public, um, is valued. As I said, they're 10, 15 times revenue. And if you cut off a major source of that revenue, um, let, me, let me back up even. Organizations and teams, if you think about the ways that they make money, their sponsorships, there's through players, and then there's just assets you own, right? But a small team isn't going to own, you know, a venue, for instance. Um, so it's really just sponsorships and your athletes. When the sponsorship dollars are really focused on Tifu, where HyperX is going to pay them but loads of money, then the content creators, to represent their products rather than paying a team, how else do teams make money to justify that 15 times valuation, to justify... People like Drake and Scooter Braun and The Weeknd and, you know, all these celebrity athletes who are invested in esports, not just through money, but, you know, through their own brands and their, their, um, their following. So how do you justify all that if there's no revenue coming in the door? Um, 
So the short answer is, you know, if this lawsuit goes Tifu's way, then it's going to be very bad for FaZe's valuation because, um, you know, I think people start to realize that uh, the community, the esports community is not your traditional sports community. And when a lawsuit drops like this, you're going to have a reaction online that's swift and emotional and unpredictable. Yeah, definitely. And it's kind of, uh, it almost gets back to what we were discussing a little bit earlier when you were talking about the franchising, because I think like the reason some of these teams, I mean, I've been around esports for a while. I know both of you guys have as well. Like this wasn't really, you know, people weren't talking about valuations this high only a couple of years ago. I think what's really kind of kicked all this off was the franchising of the Overwatch League and League of Legends and then Call of Duty um, now, which, you know, you're basically going to these organizations and you're saying, hey, I want, Blizzard is saying, hey, I want 10 or $20 million for a spot. Somebody like Hex, who's like, dude, what are you doing? $10 million, yeah. what are you talking about? And it's almost, you know, I understand it from the developer's point of view, but it is, you know, this is this is kind of my own personal opinion on it a little bit, but it's it's a little, it, it almost feels a little bit snaky. Like, hey, if you guys don't pony up this money and go convince some big time investors to give you this money, we can, because there's some really old people with a ton of money who don't necessarily understand how all of this works and we can get this initial cash in, right? Um, you know, the... The uh, long-term success and future of geolocation and franchising and all this stuff, this is not for certain. It is not this thing that's 100% set in stone. Now, I, I think it'll succeed. I hope it does. I really want esports to continue to grow and turn into traditional sports in terms of size and reach and, and respectability and all the and professionalism, all this sort of stuff. But it's no guarantee. But that initial st stance when all of a sudden, hey, you need to – pay us 10 to $20 million or we'll find an investor who can. And that guy's going to have the team and optic gaming can disappear into the ether because it's not going to be allowed to have a team in this big prestigious league. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's no question that developers have an insane amount of power and in the, in the franchise systems, they hold all the power. Um, but you know, it's, it's like you said, it's not by any means guaranteed to be the best way. If you, are an investor into Overwatch, you know, you better hope that Overwatch sticks around. Um, you know, Blizzard says that you're investing into the IP. Um, they might have another game that involves the same characters. Uh, you know, ultimately though, you're, you're betting on Overwatch. And I think you see that now with the COD slots that just got released. Uh, and I, I know we're getting a little off topic here, but Activision released their COD slots and the teams that came in, yeah, they're the same teams that, uh, are in Overwatch with the same ownership groups, but they're still paying another $30 million for each team, $35 million, whatever the number was, for that right to the franchise slot. So, right. you know, if, if I'm Activision, I'm saying, I don't even care about, you know, how well this all does. Let's just keep coming up with games and sell franchise slots for $30 million bucks a pop and, uh, you know, make our shareholders happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So we have another interesting question. So essentially, this is from Envious Echo. Um, he wanted to know if orgs really give popular players like Tifu more sponsorships than he could get alone. Now, you know, he adds a caveat, especially with how popular he is now. Are there a lot of benefits to him getting out of his contract then? And this is, we briefly touched on this, but I think this is an important point to kind of discuss for a couple minutes because, you know, when you're at Tifu size right now, like look at Ninja. Ninja is a great example for this. Why is Ninja not on any organizations? Because he made himself, he became gigantic, and now there's absolutely nothing an organization can offer him. But Tifu was not in that situation. Tifu, at the time of signing this contract, was for all intents and purposes very, very small. He had very few viewers. He was no, he was on no big brands radar. Nobody wanted to give him a ton of money. Then you inject something like the Phase Optic, like you know, Cloud9, TSM. Pick your giant organization. And they may send out that tweet. Hey, everybody, follow this guy. Follow his social media and his streams. He's our newest member. We want to show him love. Some of these teams have done a fantastic job of building a loyal fan base of people who are ride or die with that organization, which is crazy because it's not even like they're located in a specific sport uh, city or anything like that. They've just, through their brand, they've built this really hardcore following. They then give this player a kickstart, sends them up, and like, like I said a little bit earlier, way easier to get from 1,000 to 10,000 viewers than it is to get from zero to 1,000. And they basically push you straight to like a couple thousand off the bat for free. And then obviously you have to be entertaining. You have to be a, you know, 
good or talented or, or what have you to continue to retain and grow that audience, but they give you a giant initial bump. So what do you, what do you guys think on, um, on this exactly? Like if, do the orgs help the players? Like at what point, where's the tipping point there for when a player maybe doesn't need an org or still does need an org and, and how can a player spot that difference out? Th there is a tipping point for sure. And, you know, to FaZe's credit, they're really a group of content creators, right? Ninja is a content creator. These are not teams like, you know, Toronto Defiant would be a team. Um, so that's that's their purpose. They are there to help build brands. And, you know, when it's done right, Tifu waits out his contract. Um, and that's the other thing. I have no idea how long was left on this contract. They're, they're saying they're in negotiations, right? That, to me, suggests that this contract's almost up. So wait until the contract's over, find your new organization, or take advantage of the fact that you've you know just built this brand and start your own team ninja. Go hire Jessica Blevins to manage you. And then you can take all that credibility that you've built up and put it to yourself. But you know now we're kind of left in this limbo where you're with an organization that you don't want and doesn't want you anymore. You have to find a new organization, or you have to build up your own brand. But again, you have to deal with you know the fallout of all of this. Um, hopefully, the HyperX deal is still there, but uh, you know hopefully. we'll see. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, this is a uh, Adamant Gamer um, has kind of given us another little comment here, and this is something I, I vaguely remember too. I think it was six months in, or a year in, and or six months in, and then a three-year extension. And considering okay. he signed it in May of or April of 2018, 2018. that yeah. gives him, you know, another two and a half years. Or yeah, yeah, I did the math on that right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So you know, with enough time left over, then yeah, you know, maybe maybe it is worth taking this risk. Um, you know, it might just be worth breaking the contract at that point and doing the thing for hyper. Oh no, that's I shouldn't shouldn't suggest that by any means. <laughs> Well, since this isn't live, is it? <laughs> um, <laughs> Remember, guys, no, but nothing here is legal advice. Nothing here is legal advice. You'll put that as a disclaimer, right? Yes. Uh, no, but but that's just it, right? Okay, so if there's three years left on the contract, then, you know, realistically, that's your career as a gamer, right? If you're going to make the move, then, yeah, that could now could be the time. But again, you, you have to, you know, really weigh the risks on this one because now you're left with another two years in a contract that you're arguing is void in the first place. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, we've kind of kind of circled around a whole bunch of stuff here, but was there anything from the actual you know litigation filings themselves? Because those are now public. Anybody can you know, read that document. I believe it's like 26 or 27 pages. 23. Okay, 23 pages. Um, is there anything in there specifically that really stood out to you as like the key things or, or some key points of either discussion uh, or contention in the lawsuit that are going to be, you know, what this whole thing boils down to. I know you already mentioned uh, the one, but is there anything else that we haven't touched on yet that you think is like really worth noting on and paying some attention to? I think, I think that one um, being the talent agency act, you know, is really the, the focus of this. Um, the rest of it, you know, all I'd say is when you read these complaints, they are drafted very one-sided as they should be. You know, you are you're encouraged to present your best foot forward, but you have to really read it with that in mind. Um, and I think that the swift reaction um, on the part of phase has at least, you know, moved the court of public opinion away from, OK, everything that they say in this complaint is 100 percent true to. All right. There, there probably is more than this. Um, but, you know, just be cognizant of the wording. Like I already said, you know, words like permanent you know, disfigurement are there to evoke emotion or because they're legally uh, defined. They're not there um, because, you know, he had a bone sticking out of him because banks, you know, threw him off a roof or something. Um, so it's just, yeah, you have to read that in my, with that in mind. Okay. Um, I mean, the one thing that I really wanted to kind of ask you about, because I find it strange that, and I think we've kind of touched on this, but we haven't really, I haven't really gotten a, an explanation for it is, why would there be terms in a contract that you're not collecting on? So like oh. FaZe constantly says, hey, we've got this split. Maybe that is the split, but we're not taking any of the money. We're not taking it from him. What's what's going on there? 
I mean, frankly, that's that could just be a business decision. You know, if it's a little bit of money, you know, I've I've certainly done that with our clients. You know, if if you're finally getting that first thousand dollar contract, I'm not taking 150 bucks from you. Um, you know, that's a smaller amount, but you know, could be the same reason. It might just be that you know they wanted to keep things unofficial, and that's something that will come out in in this lawsuit. You know, when you um, have one thing in a contract one you know breakdown in a contract and repeatedly ignore it and break it there is an argument to be made that that provision is waived um meaning that you know we never really abided by it to begin with so you can't just abide with it three years down the line um so why is it in there in the first place you know i think it's standard for teams to include everything that they can under the sun um when you're in negotiations it can be a contentious process so you want to keep you know as much of your power as you can, and the other side's gonna do the same. But when you reach that agreement, you know, it's supposed to be a compromise. And at some point, somebody had the ability to say, you know what, that 80% figure is way too high, or we are, you know, encompassing too much into this 80% bit. Um, because I guarantee you, you know, if you put that contract in front of any 20 year old now who's, you know, your standard kind of maybe 1500 followers and just playing Fortnite for the fun of it, they're, yeah, they'll they'll take a look at it, but generally you're going to be too excited to be signing with Faze to even think about the ramifications of 80% cuts of one small part. Um, so I think that all goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, anybody, anybody with a contract, I, but if we're talking here, any gamers with a contract have somebody read them over. I'm I'm willing to bet that even the just get the high of uh, thinking of uh, how it's going to work out when you sign with a team like that. Like uh, you would might even read 80, 20 and think, Oh, I'm going to make boatloads of money with phase. That's fine. I'll be okay. Like I, people actually have like a hubris like that, which is unfortunate because that's like the clout that a lot of these orgs carry where they can kind of, um, you know, get, you know, uh, it, not not like they're pr like praying, but essentially it, it takes advantage of weaknesses of the players where they really are looking for an org. And if any any of them that have any sort of brand recognition come along in the esports scene, they're going to want to try and legitimize themselves by by siding with them. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, seventeen year old me, if I was given two options to work retail at Best Buy when I did, or exactly. move out to California, play video games, do what I love, you know, go out skateboarding and drinking. Um, and, and have fun. And that means that I'm only taking, you know, 20% of my money for a couple of years. Like that's a decision that I might be okay making. Yep. Um, and it's not till, you know, after the fact that I'm successful, that it's like, Oh crap, look at, look at all that. I signed away. Boy, that was a mistake. Um, yeah. but again, you know, he's 20. This isn't, this isn't a 16 year old. This isn't a 13 year old <laughs> as also came out. Um, you know, he's a grown man who made decisions and probably had a legal team behind him. So, you know, I, I only have so much sympathy for that. Yeah, no, definitely. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, um, contracts can obviously be bad, but especially after a certain point, once you're 20, like you said, if you don't read them, it does. At a certain point, you do have to take onus and responsibility for your own decision, right? And it, you know, if the HyperX thing is true, it does. It would, it would make this whole thing very weird because it's not, you know, you don't get to just throw a contract into the paper shredder because something way better came along now that you're way bigger when, you know, the reason you're in this place to begin with, there is an argument to be made that the whole reason you're here right now is because of the people that you're trying to throw away. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, so I think with that being said, we, we've kept you here for about, you know, 50 minutes now. <laughs> I think I just want to wrap this up with uh, your final, like words of advice for, you know, players who are in similar organizations, maybe organizations that are dealing with players. Like if you have any kind of words of wisdom for some of these guys and, and what they can do to make sure that they don't end up in FaZe Clan situation or who ends up in Tifu situation. I, I think more than anything, this just shows the importance of a well-drafted contract and agreement that is actually beneficial um, to both sides and that can be negotiated well. And that only happens if gamers, if you are either retaining or finding a lawyer or someone who is vaguely familiar with contracts to look this over and point out those 80% bits to you. Um, and on the organization side to, to seek that legal advice and get properly drafted contracts and, you know, to, to know what you're getting yourself into, because we are dealing with 
um, an industry with a lot of unknowns. And frankly, you know, it's worth it for organizations to take a little bit of risk on this stuff um, until we get some clarity on it. So, you know, gamers have to look out for themselves. Organizations have to look out for themselves. And all the while, we'll, we'll wait while the backbone of esports uh, continues to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I lied. Another question came in for you directly from chat, <laughs> uh, specifically aimed at you. So I would hate to leave uh, oh, somebody okay. wanting. Um, essentially, what they want to know is uh, this is apparently a first year law student, and he wants your advice for getting himself into esports law. Uh, network, network, network. Um, there's a lot of great uh, lawyers who practice in the space. Um, you know, very few firms that are dedicated to esports. So it's it's hard and it's challenging to be a dedicated esports lawyer, um, but certainly, you know, esports falls into to the category of, of any type of law, pretty much, right? Like I said, we, we do corporate law, we do litigation. Um, there's IP issues. There's we'll see after this criminal law, regulatory issues, right? It's esports is really just a sector, and you know, to that one particular law student, go be a lawyer. You know, go kind of get that experience and. Uh, if you love video games and love esports, and you know you find a way to work in it and network with with people, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, finally, I know this is very unlawyer like for this to happen, but I do want to ask: Who wins? <laughs> uh, it depends. No, uh, who wins? Uh, again, it'll settle. We're not going <laughs> to see a decision, unfortunately. <laughs> that's that's my guess. Okay. Um, but. Hopefully the esports community wins. Good for the realm. Good for the uh, realm. Yes. You know, that's that's what we're all hoping for. But uh we'll see. Right, like I said, this could blow everything up. Yes, yes. May he rest yeah. in peace. <laughs> spoiler <laughs> alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. We're we're past that point now, right? We can talk yeah. Game of Thrones. Just yeah, a side note, by the way, while I'm here and, and taking up the last few minutes of your time. I uh I totally missed the Game of Thrones finale. I was at a wedding at the time. So I was on a social media hiatus when this this story broke. And it took one of my friends who was just discovering esports, um, sending me, you know this guy, Slasher on Twitter? He's he's talking about law and you know, sends that off to me. I'm like, you don't understand how big this is. But I still can't look at social media until I watch. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> definitely not. You can't have that ruined for you. Right. Um, all right, Josh. Well, you know, we want to thank you so much for coming on here and breaking down all of this for us and, and educating us and the viewers and everybody else uh, who's going to watch this later on, you know, not only like the situation itself, but a little bit of esports law. And it's always great to hear from somebody like you and kind of really learn something new. Um, do you have anything that you want to plug? Now is the time, um, my friend. Gamers, we will offer you no charge pro bono contract review. Give us a call. Um, shoot us an email, Twitter DM, uh, mkmesports.com. At MKM Esports, uh, I'm at J Marcus 45. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out. Any questions? You know, we're always happy to help out the community, um, especially. Well, I, I've I've worked with Josh awesome. in the past, and uh, they're they're great guys. So I can Thanks. vouch for Thanks, I can Dave. vouch for them. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, thank you so much, Josh. We really appreciate your time tonight, and uh, all the best. We'll talk soon. Take Thanks care, Josh. Bye bye. Take care. Woo. And then there were two. And then there were two, dude. That was that was fantastic a lot. talk. Uh, learned learned quite a bit. I mean, there was a a lot of jargon. I think we definitely needed some clarity on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just uh, there's such a complicated thing, and it's like it, it could be really good for the industry if things straighten out. It could be really bad for the industry. It could give us, you know, like mm -hmm. like you said, if teams just get crippled, well, then that's where a lot of the money's gone. A lot of the big investors have wanted to yeah. put their names on teams, right? Because they see, you know, the common pitch that I've heard is, well, think of how little an NHL or NBA team or NFL team, like Mark Cuban famously, one of his best investments mm -hmm. was the Dallas Mavericks, right? And people are thinking this could be the same way, but it's just like he said, the developers have all the power. This is not a game like basketball that was invented in the 1800s and is still going to be here, like, or in 1900s. I don't know when basketball was invented, mm -hmm. guys. Don't crucify me. It's a lot, it's old game, okay? They were throwing balls in a peach bucket <laughs> or basket or whatever. Um, but it's like if Overwatch dies tomorrow, then it's like, oh, sorry, your team's worthless now. Like, yeah. we're just going to go on to this next game, and if you don't pay us another $20 million, you can't get in. It's like, what? Right. And I don't know if... 
uh, I don't know if any any company would ever draft a contract like this, but you know, to prevent something like the Tifu situation in the future, you could have a player that gets signed to a contract that would state when you, I don't know, average a certain amount of subscribers or viewers, maybe the contract slightly changes or fluctuates in a certain way where, you know, may, that way that way everybody can get certain benefits. Everyone's happy. It's almost like how they have signing bonuses for sports. They would have uh, certain incentives like um, or, or how they also have end of year bonuses for certain players like in the NFL. There are defensive players if you get a certain amount of sacks or tackles, they'll give you bonuses. Maybe for esports, for these organizations, they should they should have some sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, numbers like some influencer threshold on these contracts where it might, you know, start to take them into another tier with different incentives, so that it keeps that them, you know, keeps the morale of their actual signee uh, and 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 actual employee happy because they are their employee at the end of the day. If if they're try, if they are an independent contractor. But they are also a marketing vehicle for the brand, and they want right. them to be a represent representative of the brand. So, if they don't want to lose them when they get too too big and surpass the brand, which is totally plausible, as we've seen already from more than a few content creators, I mean, I think that's probably the best way to go about it. Yeah, I mean, I think the big problem for a lot of these guys honestly runs into the fact that obviously these teams, these brands, have to have partners of their own, right? They have to have sponsors of their own. Mm -hmm. And what happens when a different company, like let's just say this HyperX situation, what happens when they come and they offer a ton of money to you and that's like a direct competitor of a sponsor that your brand already, your team's brand already has, right? I know. It's like, I mean, in almost any other situation, like the team could say, hey, listen, we don't need anything from you. You know, we'll let you live yeah. in this house. We'll give you some perks. You're so big now. All you have to do is just rep our logo and you get all the benefit of that. You get to live here for free, blah, 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 blah. And we don't take a thing from you. We just like having you as a rep, right? Yep. But as soon as that contract comes in, that's like five times more money from another, like a headset brand or, you know, a mouse or whatever, yep. that's a competitor of your team's, you know, official sponsor in that capacity. That is where this problem runs into. So I think it's a very niche situation because again, how many Tifus are yeah. there, right? right? How many ninjas are there? Like, right. you know, you got, you got guys like Doublelift and Bjergsen and you've got, you know, Ninja and Tifu and you've got a couple of people that are at this gigantic level in their games. You know, you have like a Clayster or a Courage, like you mentioned earlier, who came from the world of Call of Duty. Um, most of esports players are not that. You know, they mm -hmm. might be very successful, they might be very popular, but they're not that. Well, that's popular. the thing. A lot of pro <laughs> a players, the, the best players, a lot of them aren't the most popular streamers. There's a there's kind of a divide there. Like the 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 po most po some of the most popular streamers are content creators at the end of the day, more than you know the best players in the world at a certain game. But being being skilled at the game definitely is a perk. Definitely helps uh, at the end of the day. But like uh, it, it also th there's two sides to that because it also if you look at a guy say for League of Legends like a guy named Faker when he first went live on Twitch. Uh, I'm pretty sure he broke the streaming record at the time, which he, he had like 150 to 200,000 live viewers that tuned in, which was unheard of at the time. So it's not to say that these pro players, these big name pro players don't have that following already. Um, that, you know, a lot of them haven't even tried. So, it, it, you know, it's it's just some, it's, it's like you said, it's a, so, it was so niche at this point. It's like an untapped world at most for a lot of players and a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how this kind of all evolves uh, and what kind of happens from it. We've got, like, literally less than 30 minutes to do the rest of our show now. Oh, that's fine. Let's let's run through. We're blazing <laughs> through. It doesn't matter. The patch the patch was almost non-existent this week. Yeah, the patch was teeny. Uh, essentially, they nerfed the shadow bombs. They nerfed the combat shotgun in mm -hmm. terms of availability. They didn't actually touch the damage or what They're those things do. Much needed but they for both of them, the, those yes. things. Yes. Yeah, I so didn't expect dude, the semi-auto sniper to come back, though. No, that's pretty awesome. But yeah, do you remember the one uh, the one game? There's one or two games where you and I played, and it's like all we found were combat shotguns. They were yes. just everywhere. I think it was at yes. Mega Mall. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah, we accidentally went to uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. They had a sale for combat shotguns, apparently. We, we totally <laughs> we messed up big time there. But yeah, it, that yeah was, uh, they, I'm that glad they... I would, that made me happy as soon as I saw that they uh, lowered the avail availability on them because I kept finding them a lot, which, you know, isn't the worst thing because you wanted you want a pretty strong shotgun in your inventory. But uh, I don't know. It was too frustrating because everybody else had one as well. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, exactly. you got to take that into account. Yeah, it doesn't really feel that strong when everybody's got one, right? Then it's just kind of yep. like you have a shotgun, not a strong yep. shotgun. Um, uh, it's been pointed out, though, that now with the addition of the semi-auto sniper back into the loophole, we now have five snipers. Is this true? If you So if you look at the heavy sniper, 
this uh the semi auto sniper maybe the boombo uh i mean am, am i wrong where where would the other two be coming from hunting oh yeah rifle. then you have the hunting rifle and then you have what would the other one be um if the, uh, i'm trying to think uh, oh the infantry rifle might count maybe, maybe. would it maybe. I don't know. or the scoped assault rifle the scoped assault rifle which is like single shot i guess that would count yeah it's hit scan, but I would I, say that I, one. Yeah. yeah so we have count. five scoped guns, which is not the best thing right now because I've been having a lot of issues lately running into places like Mega Mall and Neo Tilted, which, by the way, thank you for pointing out, Dave, that it's not an alliteration. It's Neo Tilted. It should be something tilted or t towers. <laughs> it needs to have a T. Like, I don't understand this. I mean, why did they have to do like, – that's so bothersome. Yeah, like, it is. I, I'll deal with the block. Which, by the way, love that people pointed out it should be called Builder's Block. But, you know, I, that's not my job at the end of the day. L yeah. I digress. My whole point is that going to a place like Neo Tilted and Mega Mall, you, you, you're, I've run into issues where I've, ha I've found nothing but snipers in the first two minutes of my drop. And then I get oh, killed I by a guy who has a combat shotgun. <laughs> so I really <laughs> need them to hopefully next patch take a look at this i'm sure they already can realize that they might have a little bit of a you know little little od there on the long range weapons maybe they'll be evening evening them out and don't forget they already took a, a couple of them away uh last week or at least um at least if you count the thermal scoped rifle i think that might have been the only one they took away but yeah we had more so uh i think we need to have a little bit less at this point um not sure yeah. what the plan is but yeah def we'll definitely need to change it up yeah, I mean, I, I'm a fan of most of those long-range guns. I like using them, but a lot of people don't, and they are kind of annoying. It, especially, like, if one, what happens to you when you, like, found, find, found a bunch of them in one building, binded. and then binded, binded, did, and then <laughs> somebody just picks it up and uh, picks up a shotgun, and you just can't do anything. Um, I, I never pick up the scoped assault rifle, ever. No, me neither. I never I used pick to it really up. like it, actually. I, I used like to the, love I like the it when scan. it first came out, because yeah. there was nothing like it. But right. now it's so below the realm of uh, every the, a lot of the other stuff that's available. I never touch it. And also, it, I mean, I don't know. I've been saying this for months. I've been wondering when are they going to vault this? Because I, I st it's so, in my opinion, under the radar. I feel like it is so low key as a weapon. I, I'm not even sure if Epic realizes it's still in the game, honestly, because I'm wondering where its place, where it has its place. There's I really a scoped am. assault rifle. I'm wondering where that has its place. And every time I see it, I'm just like, ugh. like I get, yeah. I just, ugh. it's like a deflation because it's not gonna, it doesn't help me in ninety percent of the situations I'm in. Yeah, I mean, I'll pick it up as a scoped gun if I don't have one, or a long yeah. range gun if I don't have one. That's about it. Um, the other thing that was kind of cool though that they announced was these hot spots. So now there's one spot on the like map. That. Yeah. And they have a bunch of these things flying around. Depends on how big the area is. It determines the number of them. Um, I believe it's like 12 or 16 or something. Um, I, don't, I don't care if uh, – uh, yeah, I saw like when the hotspots are activated in a POI, that POI turns uh, – the text goes from white gold. to gold. Gold, yes. I don't and care if Polar Peak turns gold. I'm. You can't get me to go to Polar Peak. I'm not going. All right. hater. I don't care what they're trying to add into the. It's not happening. It's not. Well, I'm sorry. That, I'm Canadian. But man. I'll That's check out last. all the other spots. I'll totally need, check out all the other spots. I feel at home in the snow. You should too. You're <laughs> from Philly. Um, yeah. But you have four seasons a week, so I should I can get used to it <laughs> all the entire map really easily. It's pretty cool because uh, there's only one on the map every game, guaranteed. But there's a 25 percent chance. So one in four games, you're gonna get two. And, you know, one in 20 games or so, you're going to have three hotspots on the map. I want to play in one of those. I played a bunch of games today, and yeah. I didn't get one of those. I was super upset. I really wanted to have a game where everybody had god-tier loot. And it was just, you know. My, that's my whole thing is, uh, well, first of all, we already know now this is definitely going to be involved with the qualifiers this weekend, as I'm assuming. So yes. how is this going to increase the use of the, the, how, how many people have rocket launchers? You know, RPGs. Mm -hmm. RPGs are pretty scarce, let's be honest, because you have yeah, to get them are. from supply drop. And even when you do, you still have a very low chance of getting them. But but now you have all this increased uh, – all these increased uh, supply drops that are going to be coming in and with all this mm -hmm. all this loot. I mean I don't know. We might start seeing a lot more RPGs in the end game. So uh, maybe or maybe not this will in turn create a lot more angry posts on Reddit. Yeah. 
Well, also just the RNG oh, no. element, right? Like because generally, yeah. especially at the top tier competitive level, Thanks people have their random. drop spots, right? People have their spots where they like to drop. So if you like to drop somewhere and you get multiple hot spots, just happen to spot on that location over the course of your ten games, that gives you a significant advantage over other players who maybe play those ten games because they might not get a single hot spot at their choice right. uh, landing spot, right? So it's like, how does that get balanced out? Because it's not, you know, I'm not a fan of the the RNG sort of elements that can that can affect a game like like this in such an important and critical time. And this to me feels very RNG. Uh, even when we go back to the shadow bombs, I mean, I was totally okay with the combat shotguns getting nursed in, nerfed, excuse me, in availability. But, you know, one of the points that I thought um, was great that Monster brought up last weekend, or last week, sorry, Monster DFA, shout out to him, um, yep. was that, you know, it didn't feel OP because everybody had them at the end of the game. Like, everybody could keep these shadow bombs because they were everywhere. But now they're right. not everywhere, so it is going to be a bit of RNG yes. again who gets them. And you can go, well, I only didn't win, and that guy won because he had the shadow bomb, right? So it's it's mm -hmm. very, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I still don't know how I feel about, about these changes this week. Again, you know, I understand that they've got to do things to keep the game fresh, but you really want them to do, like, I have no problem with the, you know, them introducing the sniper rifle again, the semi-auto sniper. Um, you kind of got to make smaller tweaks right now, at least for the next four weeks. There's only four weeks left, Epic. There's four weeks left of people trying to get into your gigantic tournament. I, I'm excited to see. It. I'm excited to see how many people actually pull the trigger after these next four, four well, let's call it five weeks after the finals. Uh, I, I want to see how many people actually quit the game that keep talking it up like, I'm only playing until the World Cup's over because I'm willing to bet that during the World Cup, they announced their next set, their next, um, pay, you know, what's on pace for the the rest of the competitive scene. You know, I, I, I'm assuming that, you know, it's all leading up to this World Cup, but, you know, I expect them to keep going with this and they're going to keep improving the game and everything. So, I mean, uh, I, I don't I don't think a lot of players are going to quit as much as they intend to. I mean, it, they're obviously trying to. Um, have the game played uh, in in their the the way that they see it and the way that they view or have their vision set up. But they're also you know there were uh, noticeable changes this week that a lot of people did say that they didn't like that they went back on. For example, there was that change with the uh, the health bar now, where when you get shot, you thought you you lost like all of your health. You thought you got lasered because now the hue on it was red for some reason when your bar got depleted, rather than a lighter color of uh, what that color on your bar was. So. Now they re uh, reverted that. So now when you get shot, it's going to be better back, you know, like a few weeks ago where you don't feel like you just lost 180 HP in one shot or got Thank sniped. God. Which, yeah, it, it, that threw me the hell off. So I'm glad they yeah. fixed that. But that, there was also a lot of problem, um, a lot of audio issues that they did fix this week again. Because, by the way, shout out to their audio department. They're, pro they're working overtime every single day. You know that. Uh, but every week well, there's, there's changes. all the developers there are. Oh, oh <laughs> indeed. But but the way that the audio, especially, especially yeah, with the competitive shooter, better. people have been so adamant on getting that fixed and that right. And now with these new slipstreams. I can't tell you how many times I've been walking and I think a guy's about to land on me on his glider with his glider, but he's just flying by like across the POI in the slipstream, you know, and it's that sound. So they've now changed it to where there's very specific sounds for if someone's gliding on you, for somebody's going through the slipstream so you can differentiate that. So little things like that where people were, were very vocal about. I'm glad that they uh, have been paying attention to try and increase the, the gameplay a little bit um, towards the end. Unfortunately, Ballers are back in the game, but you know we'll see how long that that lasts. Hopefully they're uh, not not fully they fixed. They die yet. really really quick. So <laughs> that's that's the thing is yeah, now I'm way less mad. Not than, not it the takes like three thing, bullets no. or four bullets from a good assault rifle. Like it's not a it's, it's not a thing anymore. Like it's, it's yeah. obviously they are a thing, but it's not like the same as it was for the last like couple of weeks where they were really overpowered. Um, but speaking of the World Cup, we can take a quick look at the players who managed to qualify last uh, weekend. Oh, yeah. So we had some do another uh, group of duos qualify. Um, you know, we had a couple guys from Phase, Mega and Dubs, a couple yep. guys from Hundred Thieves, CC and Elevate, uh, Complexity with Land Jock and Punisher. Uh, Europe had a couple teams from Solari. I'm not entirely familiar with that organization. Yeah, they're uh, they're live all the time. If you tune into uh, Fortnite uh, Twitch, okay. they always have somebody on the Solari Fortnite account streaming game, oh. and th these guys are pretty adamant in the community. So um, they're taking a page out of TSM's book, then. 
That's yes, a, that's a TSM yes. group big. Exactly. Uh, I know. I know who Airwalks is. He's one of the best players in Europe, hands down. So I mean, they've obviously got themselves some good players. I wonder. I just. I don't know where they came from. You know what I mean? Yeah. They weren't an organization that I was that existed as far as I know, like a year ago. So I wonder where they got the money and and the people. But yeah, kudos I mean, to them. Yeah, they've, they've got big representation now. Um, yeah, for sure. So a bunch of names. Also uh, from NA West, the team that qualified. S2J and S2 Little. I don't know if you know this, but they were they're 15 and 13. Oh man. Woo. That's these some good money even, right there. Yeah, these kids aren't even like seniors in high school yet. That's so yeah. And, and one, one of them's I not even in high parents, school. I want to know what the parents think. Uh, Your like, parents are having a midlife crisis right now. Like, I've been telling my kid not to play these video games, and now yep. he's gonna make more money than me in one weekend. What the I don't know if I should punish him or tell him to keep playing. <laughs> like, uh, you definitely tell him to keep playing at this point. You're like, absolutely. play, play, Johnny, play. We need you to play. <laughs> like, it's called striking while the iron's hot, my friend. Exactly. Um, so, you know, kudos to them because that's a gigantic accomplishment at kids their age. And definitely they're going to yeah. be games to watch out for no matter what they do in the future uh, with future games. Because something tells me if you can already qualify for Fortnite at this young of an age with how chaotic and how much skill is required into it, that there'll be, you know, esports names for as long as they want to keep playing, essentially. Oh, yeah. um, the one pair of duos that we still haven't seen come onto that list is Animal and Aspect. And I thought it was really interesting because somebody released a chart. Mm -hmm. I think I have the tweet. Um, basically saying that they're good, but they're not good enough. Like, you look, there's actually only been three teams in North America East that have qualified, or sorry, not that have qualified, but that have placed top 25 all three times. They're one of them. Really? The other two are in the event. You yeah. have Zayt and Saf. Saf and Zayt, who are like in, uh, actually have qualified already. They won and stuff. But these two have not really been able to do it. And, you know, we had Aspect on here. Uh, good kid. Wish him all the best. But they just haven't, they haven't been able to crack that bubble yet. And that was a duo that a lot of people had their eyes on to make it into this World Cup. And do you think maybe that pressure is getting them a little bit now? They've only got a couple chances left. That it, it's getting to a lot of players, um, which is kind of unfortunate. I mean, I I understand the pressure, uh, but we got to face facts now. You see the names that are qualifying for this tournament for for the World Cup. You see the names, and a lot of them are names we didn't know about a few months ago. You know, so it, it's we're facing facts now at this point that every top player, every big streamer, every pro is not going to qualify, and that's a really hard pill to swallow but it's going to be facts and i mean i just think based on and this is not knocking anybody that hasn't qualified but there are a lot of big names that still haven't qualified that i feel aren't going to and it's just based on just bad luck or timing whatever it is that there's just too many people gunning for you and now a lot of the players i see uh are, are that haven't qualified are complaining that when they get so close, uh, this was a problem with Ninja and Reverse 2K, who also haven't qualified as well. They were on the cusp this week, I believe, missed by only two points. The, they have, there's an issue with players that are getting their last few games in and want to the, – two reasons. One, they don't think they're going to – they don't have enough points to qualify, so they're trying to ruin everybody else's games by just W-keying all, all the teams rather than playing it out slowly for endgame like everybody else was in the first eight or so matches. They're doing that, and also on top of that, you have players that are trying to beat the clock thinking, oh, crap, we only have eight games, and we got to try and get as many games in as we can. So then they W key because of that, and they're just trying to, you know, try to get as many points, whatever. So there, there's uh, kind of this change that happens towards the latter portion of the qualifiers every day where a lot of the players that are really close to qualifying have so much – so much aggression that they have to worry about towards the end, and it's it, it like throws the games in for a loop. So there are a lot of a lot of issues that players have to overcome, and a lot of things that are really out of their control too at this point. So uh, with the game updating every week and new things adding, changing the the loot pools and all that, I mean, yeah, it's we got to face facts. Unfortunately, some of the top names aren't going to qualify, and it's I'm wondering like at what point are any of them going to be like, yeah, I'm I'm done trying, like to not. Say, at the very like, least, safe space. No, no, at I'm the very least, safe space. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But definitely. like, oh, I don't want to try the last week or two. You know, like no big deal. Because, but I no, hope no that gonna... you know that's, I man, the last week is going to be crazy. And I'm man, 
if somebody that already qualified like takes like a spot in the tops like again in that last week, oh man, that's gonna be some. It's gonna be some well, salty. It gives, it to, it gives it to the next person, right? Very so even true. If you qualify, very true. It doesn't really matter. Still taking more um, of that, more of the cut of that money. Yeah, though, taking the money, well which is hey, or, yeah, well deserved, earned that money. Um, but for me, like if anybody's been playing in the qualifiers and they go, oh, I'm not trying the last week, but like I don't, I'm not buying that, dude. That's an excuse. Don't make excuses. I'm not. That's that, 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 that doesn't fly. Um, and but to, to add on to your point really quick before we you know move move on here a little bit, um, for people like Ninja who haven't qualified yet, anybody who's only got a couple games left is like, well, I know where Ninja lands. Let me just see if I can land there and maybe kill Ninja and ruin his Very chance and I'll be that guy, good right? Point. So there's a way that they're like, well, maybe I can't be famous by going to the World Cup, but maybe I can be famous for ruining in just game or something like that, which is, you know, a just not cool, but I mean, yep. technically it's not, there's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that's breaking the rules about it. You're just playing super aggro right away. So it's just more yeah. BM than it is like anything you know, It's not, you're not cheating. Um, but anyway, well, I digress. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left here. So guys, last week we told you that you know, there was going to be a clips of the season. And this week we are bringing yes. you those clips of the season. But before we do that, just real quick, wanted to mention, if you haven't checked out, I probably should have mentioned this while we had Josh on. I knew I was forgetting something. If you haven't checked out our Twitter yet, guys, we are giving away a Razer Black Widow keyboard. Go there. Do the uh, retweet that you have to do. Enter the contest. There's a whole bunch of ways you can enter. So make sure you do that because, quite frankly, like it's a new keyboard. It's awesome. Do you have a new keyboard? Even if you have a good keyboard, is it new? Yeah, I wish. If not, then hey. I can't enter. I am out of the running, unfortunately. Yeah, we're not allowed to enter. I debated having my brother try to enter it for me, and I'm like, this would still look suspicious. Uh, so. <laughs> oh, good job. Hey, well, the odds. Um, all right, guys. That being said, we're going to move to clips of the season. So we're going to go through these uh, in chronological order from the first to the last, the most recent. So starting off, Week two, we have K-Dub. I think this is just going to be you and me, Trooper, because we couldn't put this to Twitter. So we're just going to have to decide ourselves who Let's got the it. best. So I think I you'll remember down. this clip. The interior oh. shotgun building. I do remember this clip. Was well, this during the Siphon Era, too? I believe so. I want to say yes. No? Wait. Oh, we got a knock. Yes. yes, he did. Yep, it is. Still, still very impressive. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a yeah, simpler dodge the gold time. One. Dodge the uh, gold turret. Nobody likes the gold turret. I love that. Yeah, yeah. He did not want to pick that up at all. I, that that was worthy of being play of the week, but uh, just because of that, I, I love the <laughs> the smarts avoiding that from your inventory. Yeah, Quickness, you were, though. You're not a fan. Old tilted too. Yeah, old school tilted. Rest we hardly peace. knew ye. Yeah, we hardly knew ye. But that was clip one from K Dub. So that All was right. week two. Uh, our week one clip is weird. Couldn't find it. Didn't really work. Anyway, it doesn't matter. All week right. three, Feeks. Hello, Feeks. Oh, uh, what is this ball doing? Oh, man, I remember this. Bops himself up in the air. Oh, the brand you new flint knock at the time. Yeah, that was the first play we saw. Uh, mm -hmm. of first First play that we saw with that with it uh, in, implemented into the game that week, and yeah, I love that he boosts himself up again just to give himself a little more time. Yeah, so it was beautiful because oh, you know you my get the no scope in the air, you get the flint knock, you get the for the win. That is still. Is there a reason? Is it is it just uh, the 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 nerves are pressing on your key, your mouse like? What when pe players do that? I'll see see them swing their pickaxe randomly. Is there an added? Uh, like, oh, you have to do that twice to make it cool. I'm not, I, I always notice players will do like a couple pickaxe swings, then pull out their sniper. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's for style points. I could be wrong. But That's what my, I thought. My understanding is it's just strictly style points. It's like That's what it seemed like to me. They need to throw their uh, pickaxe under their legs and ride it like a, like a broomstick next time. Can't do that. Then it's not in the game yet. But once it is, you're gonna sure will be soon. Guaranteed, you'll see it. And yes, probably. Uh, clip number week number four. Sorry, mess. Masterious, Masterious. This was yes. Masterious. This was one of my favorite clips. I love how it's like a European spelling of Mysterious. Oh, this was this so guy just lands funny. on this quad crusher. There's just a guy chilling on the back of it for some reason. I like, love just hanging it. out. And yeah, that guy was, on the awesome. back was probably thinking like, "Wow, all right, cool. I guess we're gonna be teaming. Hope we don't get banned for duoing." 
We're going to have solos. fun, friend. We're going to have fun. And this guy's like, oh, yeah, you are. You are going to have lots of fun. I love that he just ocean. he has no idea what's coming. He was yeah. like, hey, and I, all right, where's he making this rotation? Like, and he's clearly oh, here because you can yeah. see him. Like, he's turning his controller. Like, you can, you can, or his uh, mouse. Like, you see him moving around and looking around, but he maybe just doesn't have uh, redeploy. So he's at this point just oh, kind of stuck. <laughs> I love the reaction, dude. The guy, oh, the my literally God. dies. It's like, oh my God, did this just work? And he's just watching it. He's just looking at it. Dude, that guy fell forever. <laughs> Dude, they were high up in the air. That was so amazing. Yeah, that was a rough way to go, my friend. Nobody wants to be drowned. Oh, just my doesn't God. sound fun. Yeah, that's why, hey, you know, he's just just proving that's why you don't try and uh, doing duos in a solo. Not a lot of team. Mm-hmm. You, pay, you pay the price when you try to team. It's true. It's true. Uh, I think he was just on that quad crusher though, and the mysterious just landed on it and just kind of picked like picked it up and was like, "Oh shit, there's a guy behind me. Let's see if this works." It actually did work. Damn that! Yeah, you know, I just realized. Yeah, that that's the best part is that like I mean, the guy that was on the back probably didn't ever redeploy, so he, he there was no way off. I mean, what yeah, was he, he gonna do? He, at that point, you're just like, oh, "Well, I really hope this do? guy doesn't do this to me." So, the only thing he could have yeah, did is look, if he he's switched sitting, seats he's sitting there. after he got there. after he got ditched. Uh, yeah, he was probably trying to switch seats, like when he did that. But uh, my guess is, imagine if he, when he got ditched, he switched seats and then somehow flew it back onto land without getting. Oh man, that would have been amazing. Like he could have saved himself potentially, maybe. Could've. It maybe. would have been a little tough, but he would have had to go upside down and shot himself back toward land. Mm-hmm. Either way, I like doable. it. It was doable. All right, week five headband. Let's go. Cue it up. Oh yeah, this was the troll. This, this was I'm I'm oh, saying this right man. now. This isn't allowed this. to win. This isn't allowed to win. I remember this. Yeah, this clip was hilarious, but it was definitely not. Oh god, come it on! Would take, it would take a unanimous twenty, like twenty thirty person majority. How are you gonna do that to, for me to allow this clip to win? It's like, oh, they vaulted planes. That's okay. I'll just carpet bomb them some other way. Yeah, it's like okay, cool, bro. Thanks for the stink bombs. Appreciate you. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty funny. Don't get me wrong. It's funny. But there oh, were yeah. some good clips that week. I was, I was kind of salty. I was, I was like, too. I, I was, was like, too. How did, how did this win? Like, I'm... Yep. Oh. This is I what did. happens when you leave things up to the internet, though. You get trolled, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, <laughs> anyway. You did win that. Headband. Congratulations. You're here. You're featured. But you're not winning clip of the season. <laughs> week six. D. John's Mustard. One of my favorite spellings of a name. This this is in contention, for in my opinion. This was one of the most ridiculous snipes I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, just just what? Like, ex- <laughs> excuse me. Like how you did? How what? Who now? How did you? Oh my uh, sir. god! And he shoots when the guy's not even on, like. Oh my Honestly, god, dude! Yeah. What? Dude, that guy's spatial like awareness and geometry on a and, and everything. Yeah, on a controller guys see there was no auto aim there friends there. for all of you who say controller players have no skill there was no auto aim there nope because that was not at all nope. on the player that's that just was math like, my friend way for it yeah that is that is amazing that is the quick maths oh yeah quick, quick maths. maths quick maths all right week seven danger is a bot in my opinion though that's one of the ones that that's got to be in the running that one on feeks oh He's not done. Oh, oh he ain't nope. done. Oh my God! They're like, oh, I think uh, I don't know where it came from. They're like, yeah, you're trapped. You're as that bush, man. Ain't hey, no one's knowing where that's coming from, especially if you had a sni- a suppressed sniper. Which, by the way, we forgot to mention the suppressed sniper exists, which is another sniper that's in the game. Mm. So that would be the fifth sniper. We that would be the on. fifth one we were thinking of. Yep. Yeah. Could not think of it, but man, that was dirty. That was nice. That was, yeah, that was. Uh... Got to take into account that was in the one shot playlist though, so got to got to take that in mind. But that shot yeah, though, it's the first shot, shot was a headshot. I cannot take anything away. Yeah, I can't take anything away from it though. Yeah, it was crazy. To hit that shot is nuts. I've uh, had so many people on gliders with sniper, but not killed anybody. Well, you know what you got to do, right? Got to get good. I'll be on the next clip of the week eventually. <laughs> eventually, sneak you in there. You'll just play on a smurf and be like, "Hey man, I found something. <laughs> this is a great clip." Yep. You're going to trick me. I know it. I can feel it. <laughs> uh, week eight, Lil Jarvis. 
this was nutty. Gotta gotta crank nineties. Gotta. Yeah, if you're not cranking nineties, then what are you doing, right? Yeah, you ain't trying to be a clip of the clip of the but. week. Oh! I loved it. I remember the one thing that I didn't love is that he did have the redeploys. So he like when it went slow motion, he already yanked the redeploys out. He he didn't have confidence in the shot, which is I don't know how I feel about that one, but it still looked cool. Still was amazing. And it was, it's a yeah, crazy shot. shot. But yeah, I agree. The fact that you had the redeploys on you, it definitely should've, should've takes just away took a lot. Yeah, if you just, just had to pull it all. The, you just didn't have to pull the redeploys, man. You didn't have to see know. that. And maybe, maybe. But Tainted. week nine is actually a viewer of the show. It's in our Discord. Vainless. Vainless. I do remember I'm liking this Vainless. Clip a lot. Yeah, this clip was good. Yeah, right. He just went on a rampage on this clip, didn't he? Um, honestly, a lot of our rampage clips haven't. I feel like people don't watch the whole clip; they get like bored halfway through. Yeah, that's this what I just think. killed like eight minutes. Like Ooh. this guy killed like eight guys in two minutes, and you're like, eh, I can do that. I'm all right at this game. Ooh. Oh, I remember using. He bounces off the tree and saves the fall damage. I remember that. Oh yeah. man! And then he hit some real nice shots. Talk about that. Very very nice. Oh, slides right like, down the tree. I'm not gonna build. And that guy, and when he slid down that tree, that guy completely, I was going to say lost track of it, but no, it looks like he landed in front of him. He was gifted. Oh, yeah. But uh, it did not work. Oh, and you have a low ground. I'm, I'm such a low ground warrior. That makes me happy seeing that kill. <laughs> oh, me too. It's like I can't build with you kids, so I have to just fight from the ground. Don't have a yep. choice. <laughs> All right. Week 10. The last clip. Yes. The last week that we ran of Season 8, because last week was Season 9. Yep. Black Thunder 22. Thunder. Uh, beautiful skin, by the way. Yeah. Very nice. Oh, what's he doing? So you got the knock on that guy. Yep. This is, uh, I believe this man just kills a, a duo by himself or a yeah. squad by himself. I think for the W. Yeah. That's what I believe happens. There's five people left. Now I just bled out. Other mans. Yep. Bam. Tree out of man's. And these guys were up here hanging yep. out. They're like, oh, we got the high ground. We're going to kill this guy. Oh, the, the fact that he was able to chop that out was, oh, and that guy was so close to landing on the well, other the, uh, spot. The lower guy was building, right? What like a one-man gang right here. Jeez. Yeah, right and he right took there, him out. Like he took him out, right? So that guy was probably building and healing, and that's why the guy up top was not expecting to get taken out at all because it happened very quickly Bruh. after he died. But 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 bruh, how could you die and let me die? That was that was wild though. I love I love it. I love the clips with multiple kills, back and forth, yeah. back and forth. I'm a I'm a multi kill guy because you know one anybody can hit one shot, anybody can do one thing, but not anybody. It still takes a lot of skill. But you know what I mean. As soon yeah. as you're stringing a bunch of impressive stuff together, I'm like, oh, okay, so, son, I see your skill. So for me, I don't know about you, but for me, I got two. I got I think it comes down to two, two clips. It comes down to the first clip of the week. I believe it was K-Dub where he was in Tilted Towers, top floor, old Tilted, fighting it out, getting the edit plays. I believe that's there. And also, I want to say it was Lil Jarvis. I forget. The one that where the guy sniped him wasn't in the scope. That was brilliant. That was impressive. That's, I love that. The reason, uh, I I, that's the Jones mustard. reason I'll take that over the other ones is because the other one was in one shot, uh, and then the other clips where people were jumping out of their towers for the win. You know they had redeploy, mm, didn't put a lot of risk into it. So I, I gotta, I gotta give it to this guy, the controller player who sniped the guy that he could not see straight up. Yeah. Or uh, I gotta give it to K Dub. So what, 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 what's your preference, man? What, what do you have any other, uh, any other clips that stood no, out to you? For me, honestly, for me, D John's muster took this home. Like that was the nasty. Was, was that him? Night. That was that D. was John the, the out of yeah, the out of. And he's got a great, great name, scope. just delicious Fine. name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I thought. So if, I don't know if that's what you think, man. I agree. I think this is the clip of uh, of the season. Absolutely. Plus, this dude plays on Xbox, so I like him even more. First try, dude. Like, yeah. There's no, there's no. There's no. Uh, Bang. Like, redos or over. Like this guy is flying out of a cannon. Amazing. Flying dude. out of a cannon, and you hit that shot. Like that is. How comfortable That's are you, too, when you're launching through the cannon? You're like, all right, and you're plotting like your next Oh, yeah, you're like coming down. You don't think you're going to get like, shot out of the sky. I, I can't imagine what that guy's comms are like right now. 
dude, I just got sniped out. Of yeah, okay, dude, you always get down first. Like, I think dude, this was, I, I'm telling you, like, he's trying to explain himself. Yeah, I think that was out of the, uh, before Jesus. the respawn ban too, right? The reboot ban? Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, that's unfortunate. I mean, I guess, teammates. I guess your friend could, uh, technically pick you up if he shot his cannon to where you were downed afterwards. But if he was out there in front of you and you kind of just got shot out of the sky behind him, you are SOL, my friend. Which if he is very really likes you, maybe he would have held, went out maybe. of the way <laughs> Maybe. That's how you know if you like, if your friends like you. Do they yep. pick you up in Fortnite when you're out of the way? Yes. Exactly. But yeah, that cl cl clip of the season, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, 100%. So I don't know. We got to figure something out to get him. Uh, I think Absolutely. We'll announce it next week. Congrats, well, Dijon's Mustard. Congrats, we'll definitely, man. Uh, send you a you know, nice thank you for entertaining us so much on two separate episodes. Did it not once, but twice. You're yeah. the real MVP. So credit to Dijon's Mustard. We'll, uh, we'll figure out. Maybe we'll talk to you, see what you want, see what we can do to hook you up. Uh, get you something cool because that was awesome. I want you to keep hitting snipes like that. Yes, please do. And guys, if you want a chance to win next clip of the week, you can submit your clips next week. And if you want a chance to win clip of the season, this season, you better be sending me all of your best clips. Send Trooper all of your best clips. Just, yeah, spam yes. him with every clip, actually. Yes, just, if, if bring him like on. Just dancing, send them all. Bring him on. I love it. <laughs> I'll sift through. All right, guys. Well, this is, uh, I think, our longest episode to date. We went an hour, almost in 40 minutes. So yep. I'm getting tired of hearing myself talk. You guys probably are I'm getting really tired, starting tired to get of you talk too, man. I do. I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. If you stuck with us the whole time, you're some next level hero. We love you. Peace out. Later.